Thank you, Dr. Katz, for being here today. I know you have a very busy schedule, uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time to honor Mental Health Awareness Month uh, and to bring greater attention to our Stop Mental Health Stigma campaign across NYC Health and Hospitals. One of the things that the pandemic has really highlighted is how important it is to share our personal stories uh, because they can support and help heal one another, but also reminds us collectively that we are in this together despite our differences. So I'd love to start off on a personal note with you if that's okay. With all the adversity over the last year, including the pandemic and civil unrest due to racial injustice, what was one of the hardest moments you personally encountered and overcame? And what coping skills do you use to take care of your mental health and well-being? Well, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, wow, what a miserable year it's been for everybody. Um, the, the crisis of the pandemic, the death, the loss, loss of our family members, loss of our colleagues, sickness among our friends and colleagues, um, the very stress of going to work, for many people the stress of going to the supermarket, all done in a state of isolation from one another where we couldn't even simply shake hands or hug one another. You know, so, so difficult for everybody. Um, and sort of realizing that many decades of injustice were just exemplified in the COVID pandemic with uh, black and brown communities more heavily hit. You know, it just made for a miserable year uh, with a lack of, of any of us to really be able to console each other in the ways that we would want to. I think Zoom is great, but I don't think it's very good for reaching out to people, for connecting with people. I think humans are, are very social animals. We, we need to interact with one another. It's how we, we feel better. Um, I had many low periods during um, the year. I think like a lot of people, I felt that no matter how hard I worked, it wasn't enough. That, um, that people were continuing to, to die and what was I doing? How was I, you know, preventing that? And, you know, feelings of, you know, inadequacy, you know, so many difficult decisions to make, um, unclear data, you know, trying to uh, use analogies of other diseases to make the right decisions, uh, constantly conflicting information um, that left me many times feeling that, you know, I was unsure what I was doing. I was worried maybe somebody else would do a better job. Uh, I still wake up in the middle of the night feeling like there was something, something different I should have done. Um, you know, and again, you know, I, I realize, you know, how lucky I was that, you know, me and my primary family, we all survived it. We, we lost my father-in-law, um, but the rest of us made it through. And so I realized how lucky we are. Um, you know, my own, my own strategies around, you know, difficult situations have always been around exercise and denial and, you know, exercise, you know, because I think it that one of the ways you can discharge mental anxiety is through the physical movement of the body. And denial, you know, which has a bad rep, but you know, that's how, you know, sometimes you have to get through things. You just have to, you know, plow through and, um, you know, believe that it will, it will be okay um, in the end. Uh, because sometimes uh, it's just so painful to be, you know, in the center of that distress. Thank you for sharing so much of your personal self. I'm very sorry for the loss in your family. Um, but I just want to say thank you for absolutely everything you've done for this system and for always modeling vulnerability and transparency. That's the sign of a true leader. And I'm proud to work for the system because of what you've done throughout this pandemic. You spoke to some very hard truths, um, but it's a reality that U.S. physicians have one of the highest rates of death by suicide of any profession. And recent data is showing that other clinical and non-clinical healthcare related professions are right behind. So what message do you believe is important for our workforce to hear? And either what behaviors would you like to encourage, advice or permission would you like to grant for our sure. staff? Well, I, I think a lot can be done through connection, through you know, paying attention to um, the moods of others, 
uh, helping to lift people up. Um, doctors as a group, and I can say this because it's my profession, tend to be very critical of one another. Um, in part, it's sort of the socialization to get to be a physician. You have to have done better than, than other students in your organic chemistry class. You, you, know, you had to excel in medical school to get that residency you wanted. And it leads to this you know, not very healthy, you know, I'm better than you. And then if you feel like, well, maybe you're not as good as somebody else, I think that leads to a lot of, you know, desperation. Um, you know, as, as physicians, nurses, uh, other healers, we don't, we're not all equally talented. Um, I think I'm a good primary care doctor. I'm not the best diagnostician. Um, there are people who I know who would take a unusual group of symptoms and do a better job of coming up with a diagnosis than I would, but maybe they're not as good at connecting with people as I am. So maybe we could all sort of grant ourselves, you know, a little bit of room to recognize that we're all not superheroes. And, you know, the whole term superhero through the pandemic is both helpful and harmful. Um, because if you say that we're all superheroes, um, as doctors and nurses and other clinicians. And then we think, oh, well, no, I don't think so. I'm actually frightened. I'm aware of these instances where I feel like someone else would be a better doctor for this patient or someone else would be a better nurse. Then it leaves us feeling inadequate when instead we should recognize and celebrate the humanness uh, within us. Thank you for inviting humanness and humanity back into healthcare and into our system. We're here to talk about stigma. So when asking for emotional support, you were talking about connection just now, the experience is often fraught with embarrassment, shame, uh, fear that someone's gonna look at you as less than or that you're not fit for work or duty. So as you moved up the ranks from a medical student to becoming president and CEO of two of the largest healthcare delivery systems in the nation, how have you personally navigated either experiencing stigma, witnessing it, uh, or stopping the perpetuation of it uh, while at work? Yeah, I remember when I was a resident, I was working on a cancer ward, and it was my first experience working with um, patients who had horrible forms of cancer and would die often from it. And I remember I had a patient, and I grew very close to her during her treatment. She did well. She got discharged. And then just shortly thereafter, while I was still on the service, she came back with a recurrence of cancer. And I was very upset by it. Uh, I had been close to her. And I remember saying to her uh, attending, who knew her on the outside, you know, that's it's really sad, you know, that, that she's worse um, now. And he said to me, well, you know, you can't be too sentimental, Mitch. Um, and it was, I, you know, I saw it for what it was, right? This was his form of, you know, getting through his day. Um, but it's not a form that I want to do. I, I think that we are better clinicians when we admit that we can be sad, that we can be distressed, um, that we can be depressed. Um, that we're not perfect and that we, you know, need to go to work and do, do the best we can and always try to connect uh, to each other. And that also uh, people who have mental illness, um, that's okay too. Um, some of the highest functioning people suffer from mental illness. That's not, that's not a reason why you cannot be a great clinician. And I've known great clinicians who had you know, bipolar illness, great clinicians who suffered from serious depression, right? It doesn't mean that you cannot be uh, an excellent healer and clinician. You were such a good human being. And with you, you brought a culture change of support and psychological safety. Um, I feel very privileged and it's a pleasure to support the Helping Healers Heal program. So this is a personal question. Why was H3, Helping Healers Heal, one of the first initiatives that you chose to launch across NYC Health and Hospitals as an enterprise? I believe that you get the best health care when the people delivering the care feel good. I, I don't like punitive models. I believe that, that 
in my experience, 99% of people come to work and when they leave, they want to know they did a good job. Um, and that therefore everything should be about supporting them and helping them. Uh, we all make mistakes and we need to recognize mistakes because when we make them, we want to acknowledge them and figure out how we don't make them again. So it's not that I don't see that, that we make mistakes, but I think the central focus needs to be supporting people. And I saw H3 as a very loving you know, way to support people um, and to support them whether they you know, are someone who has a mental illness or somebody who doesn't have a mental illness but is just really stressed out by the events. Thank you. And as the final question, as we ask our employees to rise to the occasion of breaking through mental health stigma and to utilize Helping Healers to heal services for emotional and psychological support, what is NYC Health and Hospital's commitment to meeting the mental health needs that you were just talking about and the general workforce wellness needs? Is this a priority for our system? And if so, why? Uh, it has to be a priority, Jeremy, because unless we take care of our clinicians, how will they take good care of our patients. I see it as directly related to our ability to, to care for our patients. So, um, you provide great care when you have the inner reserve to give of yourself. If you're feeling stressed out, angry, resentful, um, not sleeping well at night, uh, having a difficult family situation, how can you give of yourself? Uh, the people who are best able to give of themselves have a secure sense inside um, that they're okay. And so I think by supporting Helping Healers Heal, what we're really doing is supporting great patient care throughout health and hospitals. Thank you for being an advocate and a true champion of breaking through mental health stigma in the workplace. Our system is very lucky to have you as a leader along with your cabinet. So thank you for today's time. It's been a, a pleasure and a privilege, so. Thanks, Jeremy, for all you do for health and hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.